further ado, let me invite Allison Rossett to the stage. And say thank you for being here with My us. My pleasure. Yes. Mwah. Now, I spent a dollar twenty-nine on, if you would take that away I so I could put mine yes. there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I spent a dollar twenty-nine on that little sound icon there. So could we have like a 30 seconds of that? Because I, I really did spend a dollar twenty-nine. <laughs> oh, shoot, I can't do it from up here, though. I think he has to do it from there. Maybe I should have told you ahead of time that I'd spent that dollar twenty nine. <laughs> it's coming. No, no, no. Not my dad wouldn't do that. Wait, more. like this. Get out of here. <laughs> See, you're going to be sad when I tell him to cut it off, aren't you? Okay, I think that's enough. I own that now. <laughs> Which is so funny because I ordinarily, I love that song, I do. It makes me happy. I play it on things on Facebook when they show different people, you know, cats doing it and, you know. <laughs> how ridiculous, huh, really? But I thought, how perfect for, for us today. And, and that's right, I am not a fluffy gal. But what happened was that I, um, I retired from the university. Not from the rest of my work, consulting, writing, that kind of stuff. But I did retire from the university a couple of years ago. And I was miserable. You know, everybody says, congratulations. And I'm saying, what? What are you congratulating? This is grim. Why did I do this? What's wrong with me? I mean, I was really pretty. So I was unhappy. And so I was inactive. So I was more unhappy. Quite the circle. So I thought maybe I better study up on this a little bit. What else does an academic do? <laughs> and I got interested in it. I sort of thought, oh, okay, worrying about me and my problems, maybe I could be useful to the universe. And so we, here we are today. So let's see if this is good. Okay, there, there's, your, there's my Twitter thing. So, folks, really, I'm sure there are some of you who are say, sitting there and going, happiness? Oh, my God, are you kidding? I got enough to do. Well, let's go back. That is me and my grandmother. Oh, I know, pretty cute. We were in Brooklyn. My grandmother lived in Brooklyn. I didn't, but I lived nearby. And uh, the truth is, I looked happy, but I wasn't. Um, things were kind of hard. Nothing was that easy. Uh, a little bit of a struggle. So I got in some trouble. First, I got kicked at a Hebrew school. Mm -hmm. Here, I lasted just a few months. And it was ugly. I wasn't good at it. I, was, I had a miserable attitude. And the dance teacher, who clearly needed the money, still kicked me out. <laughs> who gets tossed from brownies? <laughs> Well, actually, I got tossed twice. I got tossed. My mother begged me in. You're a, you know, you're a humanistic organization. Don't you want to? Right? And then I got tossed again. I wasn't a happy kid. 
And I wasn't particularly good at it. You know, making lanyards, being nice. I wasn't good at those things. <laughs> and then I went, and then there was college, where I got a job in the library. My mother said I had to have a job. <laughs> I got a job in the library. And about a month later, the associate librarian called me in to tell me they no longer needed me because I didn't have a library personality. <laughs> what the pro my job was to do shelf reading, you know, make sure the books are in order. And the, it's not like one, two, three, four. It's one, two, H, V, three, Y, nine. <laughs> and much more interesting than shelf reading, which is dismal, is reading the books. So what would happen is I would read it, I'd do shelf reading, and then and a half an hour into it, I would find a book that looked good and read the book. All right, so miserable, failure, but not totally. I was not all misery. I liked school. I was happy at school, and I was a good reader and a good doer. And I liked sports. I was an athlete. And at school I played many, many sports. So what I was discovering was more happiness, more production. More me miserable, more me sitting around. This was true when I was little. And it was true in the most difficult transition of my life to retirement. And believe me, for me, it was the most difficult transition. So what I want to talk about today, and what I hope to put on the plate for you all, is happiness, huh? Like, what is it? Happiness who? You mean us? And happiness how? And I'll review some of the literature with you. OK? Huh? Who? How? Keep it simple. We'll start with huh. Like, like, what is this, this thing? OK. I'm not going to be all technical and organizational psychology with you. If you look at the literature, there's huge amounts of overlap between job satisfaction, engagement surveys, commitment, passion, happiness. And it all relates to the individual's feelings about themselves at work, just as Brent was showing you the rings of pain, or whatever he called it. <laughs> the rings of fire. <laughs> and it's exactly the kind of thing the San Diego Chargers would roll out. I was looking at it. <laughs> rings of torture or something. Because that's what they're doing to us, the Chargers. <laughs> Commitment, motivation, passion, self at work, self on teams, self on tasks, and self in the enterprise. And that's where it comes from. How you see yourself on the tasks, the team, the general work and purpose, and the organization. This would not be happiness at work. I th I'm looking here and I think maybe it's, it's not his team that's the problem, perhaps the tasks. Or perhaps the resources. Yeah. He needs technology. <laughs> or this burned out nurse. Here things are looking better. And here's one of the first key lessons on happiness. Together. Not one alone, one among many. More like this. And more like this, doing things that we value. So what is it? First off, it's a positive feel for what you're up to. My work is important. I could do this for my entire life. I like the folks I do it with. So it's a positive feel for the task, the job, the team, the organization, and what they're up to. You are immersed. You lose your sense of time. It's the Chick Mahaley flow thing. 
Where'd the day go? This is big. Clear, known purpose. And if you look at the literature, if you look at the literature, it is astonishing how little match there is between people and their job descriptions and people who have no clue what their job descriptions even say. Clear, I know what is expected of me. I know how I contribute to the organizational strategy. I know what I need to do. I know how to make a difference. And this is another big piece. Some agency, some self-determination. I influence what goes on. I help to make key decisions. I know what I need to learn to contribute. Agency, self-determination, not totally, not the czar of it all, but some power, influence. Now, so that's what happiness is, and it's all those nice words, committed, engaged, passion, joy. Here's what is important. It matters at work. The University of Warwick did a study. 12 happy employees are 12% more productive. When I saw that, I thought, that's ridiculous. I'll bet they're 100% more productive. I mean, how do you even measure more productive? Positive emotions invigorate employees. Can I get a nod? Do positive emotions invigorate you? Sure invigorate me. When workers are happy, they collaborate better. Think on that. They've done, these are studies. This is not just my opinion. But, 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 most folks are not. They are not happy. They are not engaged. The majority are not. Now, this is a Gallup. Gallup says only 13% are happy, engaged, and committed at work. I don't know. Does that sound right to you? How many would say that's about right? It's about right. I don't know. Here's another study. The numbers vary, but the net story is clear. Bottom line is clear. There is not enough happiness at work. Now, the conference board, pretty, pretty legit agency. They've been running job satisfaction surveys, broad scale job sat surveys. In three decades ago, 61% liked their jobs. Now, the numbers are much lower. This is not good. And meanwhile, we're trying to teach them to do their jobs better. So we're basically <coughs> encouraging them to have better skills when they're all bummed out. OK, so that's happiness. What it is, it matters. Really, it matters. Look at this. I think this is a really interesting piece. Perhaps the most misunderstood driver of performance. Most people believe if I make the sale, then I'm going to be happy. All right? If I get the promotion, then I'll be happy. If I get the bonus, then I'll be happy. But the literature suggests it's the other way around. Bummed out Allison, as a kid, was a muck up in brownies and dancing school because I was an unhappy little one outside of school. In school, happy. Outside of school, not so happy. And it had a direct relationship. Here you can see the study. Blah, blah, blah. Laura King and Ed Diener found strong evidence of directional causality between satisfaction and business outcomes. And here's where it's important to us. So that's the link, happier, more satisfied, more engaged, more committed, more productive, more collaborative, ooh la la. But there's, look at those last two paras. This sense of well-being is surprisingly malleable. Thus we have an opening. People like us can make a difference. We can help them find glimmers of joy. Glimmers. I'm not saying you can take a sad sack and turn them to a happy person. Let's not kid ourselves. Glimmers of joy. 
in touch with the good stuff. So what is our job? What is it really? And this is just my opinion. I think results are our job. I do. I've always thought that. See, Brent said I wasn't fluffy. <laughs> and I'm not. I mean, I really do think. It's a, and I hope it's a broad array of kinds of results. In our business, it's creating options for people. And I believe also helping people find satisfaction and joy in the, in the work they're doing. And also, given what we do, improving that work so that it could be a little more satisfactory. So they have more tools, more access to resources, more access to smart people. OK, so performance is our job. Diagnosis is our job, knowing who they are, where they're going, ha helping them see that. Who are they? What do they, what do they know? What do they feel? John Dewey in the 20s and 30s. It was a revolutionary American moment. Now, this is really a big deal. John Dewey, I know this because I write, write books about needs analysis, or I wrote them, actually, wrote. <laughs> Not going to write another one. Um, John Dewey opened up the door to the question, what do people feel? Before that, no one had ever asked. What do you feel? Do you want to know this? Can you see what you're going to do with this? John Dewey. That was so radical. OK, so part of our job is diagnosis, hopefully along an, an array of spectrum, many continuum. Where are they in light of expectations, and not just the narrowest of expectations, like you know, safe behavior while driving the truck, but other parts of this. Prescription, given needs and expectations, we make and then we match resources. We serve them up. We build training, sure, but we also build performance support, job aids, and curated resources, and mobile learning, and what coaching opportunities, and so on and so forth. Curation, here we gather the smarts in the organization, and also beyond the organization, making it all accessible, useful. And finally, I believe we have a role to play in culture. 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 So, culture is so much with us, we scarcely notice it. That's how you know it's culture. And that, in part, is my purpose today, to say you are an agent of culture. You are an agent of passion and commitment and engagement. You're in a good position for that. OK, not just us but certainly us. Not just us, but certainly us. So I'm not saying that HR isn't it, or I'm not saying that IT isn't it, and I'm not saying that benefits and compensation are. But sure as heck, it's learning. So I talked about happiness, huh, what it is, happiness who, why I think it's us, how about now how? I think there are six foundations for us to, to be this kind of an agent, a happiness agent. First, we have to believe the people we serve want to learn and grow. Right? We have to believe, not that they are slugs that we inherited, but rather that they really yearn to grow. I mean, that is one of the reasons that I loved the work I did all those years at San Diego State, because those grad students yearned to grow. So I could get involved in that. What a deal. What a deal. What a blessing. OK, so if you're sitting there and saying, I am stuck with legacy people, legacy technology, <laughs> legacy lousy attitude, OK, so first up, trust. You got to think well of them. Respect. You got to think well of them. You got to acknowledge their humanity, their uniqueness, their diversity. You got to remember, and I was talking with some folks today about that, the, earlier today. Uh, you signed up for a people job. You didn't sign up for a technology job. 
You may be helping people use technology, but you sound, signed up because you're interested in human beings. And what a, what a messy, tasty, mushy group. Get on with that, get on board with that. What is that? You know, these th this thing, it calls me, it, tell it just told me that the Padres did something. <laughs> yeah, they came in last in the National League West. And soon the Chargers will join them. But honestly, it's sending me notices about the Padres. Hopeless. How many of you are from San Diego? Not so many. Well, you know. Go Cubs. Go Cubs. <laughs> Certainly better off saying go Cubs. Okay, the literature tells us that benefits do matter to happy employees. They do matter, big shock, but they are not a sufficiency. We've got to be on board. If there are benefits, how good are you at helping them access tuition reimbursement, for example? How much have you built that into your programs? I cannot tell you how many organizations I've consulted in where I say, how about tuition reimbursement? What's involved? How are you do involved with it? How is it linked to the programs you're on? Oh, we're not doing that so much. If not you, who? 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 Inquisitive. We have to be curious about, about our people and about the work they do, about their industry. Are you reading those journals? And, and about our field. Well, obviously, you're interested in our field or you wouldn't be here because it is a yummy field. I mean, their field might not be so yummy, but ours is yummy. <laughs> All right. Also, systems and wholeness and recognizing learning, not as the force, but as one of the aligned forces that wrap around people and make, give them joy and give them alignment and enable them to get it done. And finally, urgency, not later, now. One of the things that always bothered me, I, as I said, I loved the university, but one of the things I didn't love about it was it wasn't urgent. And people would say to me, why, you know, why do you do the consulting? Because when I was out there working with an insurance company or uh, uh, the zoo, or a nonprofit, there was, well, I'm not the nonprofit so much, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were, they are much more urgent. Be urgent. Generations? School, K 12, what is it, waste generations? Come on, urgency. So, I contend that taking on happiness, Taking on happiness, taking on engagement, commitment, passion, and joy is different. You are acknowledging a role in the pursuit of happiness. I mean, that's pretty lofty stuff. And that you will do things to lift the spirits of associates and the enterprise. Think about that. You're, you're saying, I want to do that. So now, uh, ideally, you say, what do I do? Let's, do, let's talk about that. First up, deliver clarity. Now, I'm not kidding. Now, this you could say, oh, that's neuroscience. Yeah, it's also truth. I cannot tell you how many organizations you go into. I was involved in doing lots of evaluations and need studies, still do some, and people don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're expected to do. They don't know what goodness looks like. They don't have a clear, I was involved, I'll, I'll tell a story of a real project we did for a bank here in town. And one of the things we did first was to define what goodness looked like in detail for the different levels of tellers. And to create vivid pictures of it, not boring competency statements, but vivid pictures of it. We delivered that report. Then we were going to be building online learning assets, but then they decided not to invest and rather to sell the bank. What else is new here? To sell the bank. But they had all these vivid pictures of what goodness at the different levels of teller performance looked like, distributed those and saw great leaps in performance 
just by being clear about what was expected. Chew on that a little bit. Okay, clarity. Communicate what is expected, how they fit into what is expected, what it looks like. Do it in a vivid fashion, not 14 pages of 1.4.a.2. You know what I mean. All right, offer a path forward. Define expectations for skills, knowledge, and results now and future, and for options to grow along that trajectory. That's a guidance system. So one of the key things we know about what works for learners is guidance and choice. Not just choice, guidance and choice. Provide a way for them to see their sel themselves. Because if they can't see themselves, in light of the expectations, in light of now and future, if they can't see themselves, how can they make choices? That's what the guidance system looks like, All right? Provide a way for them to see themselves, look at themselves, understand themselves. You don't need me to read these, but conversations rich with feedback. Get supervisors and peers involved. Give them authentic challenges. I remember working on a sales training program where we'd put up all these case graduated, oh, I better put this down, I'm gonna spill that. <laughs> graduated sales challenges where more was known, less was known, much less was known, much more complicated requests, much more complicated context, and they competed on, it was all online, it was a wonderful way for them to measure themselves and develop themselves. It was nifty. Create a sandbox. Build, buy, and curate experiences, programs, and assets that match the trajectory, the path they must travel, the expectations. Ah, I said this already. Enable choices, enable agency. Provide both guidance and choices. Do not let them flop around. Or if they flop around, make sure you have support there for them. Because if they flop around, they will feel a lack of confidence. And if they lose confidence, it kills motivation, right? The role of confidence in motivation is huge. Two things produce a, a, a motivated employee, confidence, and high value associated with the activity. They're related to each other, right? So if I can't make the system work for me, if I can't pull up the video, I'm supposed, I'm, I have two ways I'm gonna go, right? I'm either gonna say it's stupid stuff, which is then I'm not putting value on it, or I'm gonna say I'm stupid. You gotta be a genius to operate the system. So guidance and choices together. And that's why the work we do isn't so easy. It's kind of hard. <coughs> Finally, literature really clear. Cultivate a social connection, a bond. Get the sales folks working with the sales folks. Get the sales leaders working with the sales folks. Get the sales leaders working with the sales leaders. Create relationships across geographies, across any kind of chasms. Look at this example. I just love this example. Ochsner. This was for 11,000 employees, leaders, doctors, nurses. Look what they have to do. When employed, this is really interesting, folks. When employees walk within 10 feet of another person in the hospital, they must make eye contact and smile. I discussed this with a couple of my friends who are nurses. They thought it was really interesting, but they didn't want to be forced to do it. I thought, <laughs> if I worked there, you'd be forced to do it. <laughs> <laughs> when they walk within five feet, they have to say howdy. Look at that. And then they have data that suggests it made a difference. Look at the data. But what's important to us is bond, social support, appears to lead to not only happier employees, but also more satisfied clients. In other words, results. Results that matter. I love that. So one of the things I'm about to get to is that it's all about 
encouraging reflection, mindfulness, appreciation. Here's what we want them to reflect on. My brother, who had everything on earth to be happy about, really wasn't so much. And the reason was he compared himself. He didn't make as much money. He didn't have as much fun. He didn't, I won't go on, but other things along those lines. One of the key things is self versus others and their circumstances. There's a big body of literature on satisfaction and relativity. So how can you help people to see the benefits of where they are in light of other people? And I'll give you an example. My brother was a doctor, and he complained, <laughs> make as much money as other kinds of doctors. I said, brother, do what I do. Come compare yourself to professors. You'll think you're doing great. <laughs> Worked for me. Next thing on reflection. What's your trend line? Are you getting better? Are you growing smarter? Are you clearer about where you're going? Are you clearer about your role on the team? Trend line. Next one, self and your, where are you going for the future? Have you got a picture of that? Do you know where to go to get a picture of that? And then, as I've said before, your view of the goodness of the job you do, the role you play, your team, your organization, the tasks you have to play. This is the details of self and conversation are, are, you know, are really pretty darn interesting. Amway, for example, is concerned that they have a very global operation. They are, that wasn't so good. We'll turn it off. I said stop. Now we'll stop. This is not going to make people want to buy the Apple Watch, is it? Like I care. Um, I'm not sure why I bought the Apple Watch. Other than it's kind of fun to play with, but probably better not in front of 100 people. Anyway, the point with Amway is they didn't want their people flopping around. They use a coach in multiple languages, because it's for global, explaining exactly how you use their online learning programs, because they don't want them lost. They don't want them lost in space. They want them guided. I love Tom Kuhlman's um, community, online community. I check it out all the time. This, look, I mean, look at that dog. Keep it real with fake text. And this is the cons of social media. And that's what I like so much about him. He had a whole thing on the benefits of social media. Then he does a really creative thing on what the negatives are of social media. And you can see it here. He can deliver so much, it's just too much of it. And then he talks about how to turn the cons into pros. So clever. And such a good place to go to meet up with people like us. I find it, you know, just great. All right, how do we do this? So I gave, you had one slide where we talked about clarity and guidance and, and choices. Here's the softer side of this. This is, this is me in a moment of fluff. I believe we have to encourage reflection. What difference did you make today? What effects did you have on customers or services or colleagues? Here's a biggie. Appreciation. How did you encourage appreciation? How, I mean, one of the things the literature says, and this, you, you've, you've seen this, this before, how can you focus on strengths while helping them address deltas and gaps and needs? Encourage appreciation about what are they thankful? Sure, they have a job, but what about the job are they thankful? What differences do they make in that job? Anyone they want to thank? Have they made that? Have they said thank you? 
Have they paused to do it? Encourage generosity. One of the things I found in the literature that both, most surprised me was, and of course there's all these saws and cliches that say it, but you get a bigger boost in joy and happiness for giving and helping than you do for getting something. Isn't that interesting? Encourage generosity. Doing something generous yields more happiness than receiving something. Help a customer, help a colleague, do pro bono work, advance the pro bono efforts in your organization. Build them into the learning organization. Ask for action. All this reflection, encourage reflection, encourage thanksgiving, encourage appreciation, encourage a focus on strengths. What are they gonna do? Ask for action, ask them to make a, a public commitment. Of course, managers and supervisors, it cannot happen without them. Build it into their development and reviews. Talk about it in onboarding. Make sure that they know it is expected of them. Give them tools, little easy tools to help them have these conversations. The tools are half built here. You can just stick them, in, give them to them. And finally, model it yourself. Are you in touch with how you're happy? What you have to be thankful about? How you can be more generous? How you were generous? How you can be more generous? I loved this visual. Could not control myself. <laughs> Sometimes the attitude adjuster, that would be us, might have to adjust her own attitude. And here it is, how am I feeling about my work? Can I point to something I like about this job? About what we do, what we contribute to the universe, what I do? Am I seeking out colleagues and am I listening to them? I mean, I'm sure that that one, am I seeking out colleagues and listening to them? That, just reading that and going and doing that out at the university would have helped. It certainly would have given me and the person I was listening to a nicer day because we're so busy, doing, doing, doing. Can I see how I've improved? Have I learned anything today? Have I used my skills to help someone else learn? Have I complimented someone's strengths? So it's not just about them, it's not just about our role, it's about each of us individually. So I thought I would produce, because I love performance support, <laughs> thought I would produce a little old checklist, but that doesn't look happy, but wait. You notice I picked the faces that were drawn in the sand. Get to the beach. This is nice over here, this is the bay, it's good, very good. But also you should get to the beach. And if you want restaurant suggestions, you know, you, there's, there are lots of places. Okay, so you have to believe that happiness and joy and commitment and engagement matters, and you have to believe it's on your plate too, along with all those other things. You have to believe that the line and the learning organization are partners and are gonna work together. You need to believe in the power of clarity of expectations, like the example I gave you of the bank tellers. I mean, that is really a true story. You need to provide them with this paths to success, rich options for moving along paths, aided and unaided. Aided would be performance support, job aids. Unaided would be all kinds of learning, moving it to memory inside the mind, the heart, and the belly. Right? Unaided. But aided is, this checklist will help you with that. Choices and guidance systems, both. Social bonds, this is what the literature tells us, will help produce happier employees. A culture of self-assessment and reflection. Mindfulness about strengths and lots and lots and lots of thanksgiving. You know how much you like being with people who are givers of thanks. And I don't mean just to you. And finally, 
all this thinking they're doing, appreciating, thinking, reflecting, they have to do something active in light of it. Right? Um, there's a word that, that I learned when I moved from the East to the West. And the word is omphaloskeptic. I know. It's an unbelievable word. That's why I like it, because it's so bizarre. And if I had a thing, I'd write it up here. But um, I could do it on here now with this, my new system, but it won't fit on my screen. Um, o m phalo, p h a l o, skeptic. Right? And what that means is, anybody know? Focused on your belly button. In other words, it means obsessed with your own process and your belly button. That's why the last one is so important. While we, we've gotten so busy being productive and making and producing and buying and building and adapting, diagnosing and prescribing, assessing, maybe while we're reflecting and appreciating, maybe we need to also be sure that they're ready to do something as a result. Do something. Otherwise, this is just all um, skeptic, which is not, as far as I'm concerned, positive. I don't want employees who are um, skeptic. I want employees who are mindful, reflective, appreciative, self-assessing, and constantly assessing, growth-obsessed, and bloody active. They'll be happier. Happier. So, let's look at the checklist. And what I want to do is hear from you now. Look how good I am, okay. Are you an agent dappiness? What are you doing about it? What more could you do? What obstacles will you confront? What strengths can you build on? So, let me come down here, and I'll go back to the checklist. Would you like that? Tell me. Yeah, Candace. Yeah, I think that would be true, and that would make you more happy, exactly. which is always a good idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you want me to? Okay, we can. Ha I'll hand it to people. Here you go. So, um, in my organization, oh, why do you say where you work, Candice? Where do you work? University of Oregon. Oh, University of Oregon. <laughs> go Ducks. Go Ducks. I've worked. <laughs> go Aztecs. Right on. <laughs> Except they lost two this weekend, of course. Yes. Okay, so I work at a startup in Silicon Valley, and our job, we make software that helps over 400 banks detect fraud. Cool. And my job is to teach customers, which it's the coolest thing ever. You know, I'm from a small Midwest college town, and this is beyond amazing. But one thing, I love my job, but one thing that I did to help the IT department would send out these emails trying to get us to do something. <laughs> and Exhortation. Eat your vegetables. And one day they asked me, why is nobody doing this? And I was like, well, okay, if you're going to ask me, let me tell you, I don't know what you want me to do, and you told me what you want me to do. So I helped them. Clarify uh, their expectations I and simplify, I bet. I gave them an analogy. The best emails, instructions look like children's books. Very few words, lots of graphics, and white space. Mm -hmm. I actually just posted something, I think, on my Facebook page. But whatever, whatever it was, it was, a, it, was an, um, here. it was an article, uh, a very short article, on how you can fix your email. Oh, oh e it's called Email Zero or <laughs> Inbox Zero. It's, the article is called Inbox Zero. You can find it. And basically, they said, <laughs> do it in the subject. Right? Do it in the subject. Don't say hello. No more than three or four sentences. And don't say goodbye. 
But of course, I looked at that and I thought, well, that's very process oriented and that's good and, and I like it. it and I'm kind of oriented that way. But uh, better would be to find the right three or four sentences, you know? Okay, more. I want you to talk to me about happiness. Look at the checklist. Can you do it? I'm coming to you. Say who you are, where, you, where you're at. Okay. Hi, I'm Linda. I'm from the Chicago area, and I work for a biopharmaceutical company. Um, so for happiness, um, lots of, um, we were part of a spinoff, so lots of reorgs as far as um, being um, sort of a top 10 pharmaceutical company, trying to get settled into our new business line, lots of reorgs. I've had um, six managers in five years, so you can kind of, and, and I'm not, isolated, uh, the flux of the environment. Um, so we got a new leader in about two years ago, and actually the key to it was for us, at least, the culture. And she actually gave uh, people permission to be happy and whatever happiness meant for you. And so a lot of what you've talked about, reflection, mindset, she enabled that, that with permission, gave people resources. So. What's so weird is, you know, I was part of the old company with a 125-year legacy. So seeing the transformation, it really came from the culture and really from the top up of, you know, I can't, you know, when you have thousands of employees and you're a global company, happiness means something so different from everybody. But if you enable everybody to do that and you give them permission, it sort of became a grassroot mm -hmm. uh, type effort and it became so contagious and so, um, I've been in the organization for a while now, and I'm so happy. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I would arm wrestle you for my job because I love my job. You'd have so. to, and, and she's, I'm not, she, she's already, she's there already too. That's wonderful. Okay, there's got to be somebody who's, yeah, go, sure. But I want somebody to be thinking, I'm not so happy, or I'm only a little happy. And I'm not sure, so sure my organization wants me spreading happiness throughout. <laughs> so I'd like to hear about that. But not you. No, you can say what. But then the next person, I want you to admit, well, we, we do software, or we drive trucks, or we do safety, or we sell insurance. We don't do happiness. Uh, with, a, with the team I had at uh, Banner Health, we, when I started working with the team, their, uh, their engagement scores were 67% out of 100, so every other person literally hated being there. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. Good times. What an opportunity. Yeah. So what we, what we worked on over the next couple of years was to um, not just to make them happy, but to make them vulnerable to each other, to allow them to say, I'm not happy, or I need, or... Um, Jane, I needed this from you and I didn't get it, so, that so I failed. Um, not, wow. not blaming, but the openness to be able to say, I, I, need, I depended on you. So we did that, and when, um, uh, so in shifting and letting them say, even things like, I don't know how to do this, who can help me with this, um, it became so strong in my team, we um, eventually shifted to having 95 plus percent engagement and that, wow. was, that was the biggest change we made, was just letting people say, I'm unhappy and I think it's okay, I, sh I should be able to say that out loud and not be punished, or I'm disappointed or whatever. That was the biggest change we made. Wow, cool, yes. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little time machine here and go back about four months when I was still working for a, an educational publisher. And uh, I, I was laid off in June. <laughs> and it was an environment that, um, very impassioned people who were being shut down. Um, you know, th there was not any kind of, how are we gonna survive this downsizing of the industry? You know, th there was no admission that there was a, a, a crisis going on in the industry, you know, the, 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 that the publishing industry is shrinking. And so it's getting tougher and tougher and co more competitive and what have you. And there was no discussion of that. The upper management you know, didn't want to talk about what was going on in, down on the, on the line. And so those of us who were in sales and who were you know, it, meeting with customers, just every day was a grind. And it was a grind and a grind. And there was no acknowledgement of how difficult that was. And, you know, so there's, I, I think part of happiness, honestly, with rich for, for, for conversations. Us, is rich conversations. Real conversations. conversations. Real conversation. Admitting we have a challenge here. Mm -hmm. 
this is not a good environment. <laughs> and, and we wanted to talk about it. And management kept snuffing it out. Interesting. Thank you. And I'm happier not to be there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, pub the publishing industry, I, I obviously have worked with the publishing industry. And uh, the th now there's another example of lack of urgency. I mean, like, you know, luncheon cocktails all day. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Somebody had a hand over here. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Henrietta Riesco, and I come from Seattle. Anybody else here from Seattle area? Yay! Hello. I miss you. My niece so, is moving there. Mm. So I work for a PR agency called We Communications, and we are about 700 people, privately owned. So I see a different shift, like completely the opposite. So we were like, happy, everybody should be happy, so we don't talk about bad stuff. <laughs> and then the business was bad, right? So That sounds like what he was talking about. Well, maybe they weren't all happy. Uh, they were probably uh, miserable and not talking about so it. You it was, all were happy. It was kind of weird. It's like, hey, everybody should just be happy. Everything is just about everybody smiling. Oh. And uh, then the you know people would get amazing reviews, but the business was bad, so it didn't match. Like, how can you have 20% overachievers if you didn't meet the goals, right? right. So then... They're all from Lake Wobegon. Then we went to the other extreme, right? Like, everything is about business. And now it's kind of still that fake happiness there. And on top of it is, like, pressure for business. So what do I do? I don't know. <laughs> how do I bring happiness back you with the business? You want to say something? Talk to her. Well, I don't know that I have an answer, but I have a similar question. Because, you know, I think about this, and I'm listening to you, Allison, and I'm going, I'm all in. Let's, I'm all in. Let's, let's do get happiness, happy. right? Right. Kind of similar to your situation, our business, kind of fear to Midland, not making the goals, but a lot of people are getting great reviews and stuff. When you bring up, hey, we've got to fix this or none of us are going to have yeah. jobs, right. then it's, well, why aren't you happy? Why are you, why are you negative Nelly? You know, and, I mean, I'm kind of a Jim Collins kind of guy. I confront the brutal facts, never give up hope. How do you balance the reality of like our situations with this idea of happiness, I think a lot of business leaders are like, well, once we get the business problems figured out, then we can focus on happiness. I think probably a lot of us in this room think, if we fix the happiness problem first, the results would probably come. Well, I think a richer, I think that's, yeah, I think a richer set of conversations. I mean, if you're in the publishing industry and you're not changing, if you're in higher education and you're not changing, if you're in software and you're not changing to the new version, right? And we need to be part, we need to be part and parcel of that conversation. And if you see they're not changing and it's happy talk or long lunches with drinking, um, <laughs> elsewhere, elsewhere. I would talk to your leadership who would, again, talk to the C-level about are we being realistic. But that doesn't mean they're going to they're gonna listen to that. I mean, I think if you recognize we ain't got anything to be happy about here, and there are situations, perhaps, if you're a publishing company that is only looking at the old textbooks and not looking at the new world, <laughs> maybe you don't have anything to be happy there, about there. And it is, as you said, Happy to be gone. Moving on. I mean, it's very hard to talk about strengths, appreciation, Thanksgiving, uh, new learning, when the building's falling in around you. So, yeah, you want to talk? Sure. Let me come to you back there. I'm getting my steps. Every time I'm in a keynote with you, you change my life. <laughs> So, 20 years now. <laughs> You're so sweet here. Thank you. <laughs> Trish, old Chicago. I know you. I but know they, you. They, they, how you doing, honey? I'm well. It's, it's good to see you. You want to take our picture together? That'd be nice. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm live feeding this now. Oh, he's live feeding this. Hi, everybody. Great. Oh, great. Don't hope my brother's not watching. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, Don't worry, he's uh, not. so the question is like how to do this, and I love this because this is a roadmap for us down on the operations level. 
And this isn't only happening in organizations now, this is happening in countries. This is how <laughs> countries are now competing for tourists. This is how countries are competing for citizens. This is, and actually, so in what you were just talking about, some of these industries that are reluctant to change, resistant to change, you have to look for the organizations and the industries that have a burning platform. And it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Allison, and that is not just the people willing to grow themselves, but the organizations and the industries that are willing to grow as well. Right. And if they're not, then you know, there's, like you said, there's kind of a telltale sign there. But this is the work that we're doing in the UK with the water utility market that's getting deregulated in 2018. They have to, you have to change, you have to get on board with change and learn how to compete for customers for the first time, then you need to have a people-centric workforce. So we've, I think that's the other thing too with us in L&D is we feel disenfranchised that we've talked about people being important for a really long time, but it hasn't necessarily happened, it's happening. It's happening. These are the new competitive factors. And the other one is the work that we're doing in the United Arab Emirates is around happiness. They're competing for tourists and tourist dollars and for citizens by growing happiness, cultivating happiness within the government agencies in order to provide hospitality, guest experience at a government level, not just in the hotels, but at a government level. And it's big business. Wow. So, Allison, thank you for this today, because this is <laughs> the way pleasure. forward. My pleasure. Let me see. Okay. Thank you, Trish. Thank you for saying that. That's wonderful. Thanks. All right. You know we can do better than a gratuitous, have a nice one. Look at this. Welcome to biology. No laptops, no cell phones, no tablets. Have a nice day. <laughs> and, and, th and that professor thinks she's trying, or he's trying. <laughs> They're trying, all right. <laughs> so here's some resources. Here's some books I'm selling. <laughs> not here, I'm not selling them here. Yakety yak, blah, 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 blah. So, well, I'm so much happier now, you know? Uh, actually, the literature, I, let's see, as I said, I was reviewing it, suggests that we, as we age, we do get happier. No kidding. Not all the way forever. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's when we have aided happiness later. But <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> but truly, and what they say is up to about 40, then 40 to 75 or something, the happiest. Huh? Huh? It's true. I think it is true. I think it's true. Do you think that's because we have uh, it's unhappy experiences with the dead? So now we can say we've lived through this. We know what unhappiness looks like. Yeah. We know what unhappiness looks like, so now I have a greater appreciation. I think it's that. And I think it's that. I think. I've, I've said to a friend of mine, you've been in this relationship forever. This is great. How did you do it? And she said, I lowered my expectations. <laughs> but remember, I said clarity of expectations. They don't have to be the highest of expectations. Joe? That's, yeah, somebody said that over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, right. Right, right, right. I used to do all these meals and dinners with people I didn't want to do it with, and dinners, and uh, no more. I don't do that. Yeah, yes, sir. I had a friend years ago say he wasn't getting older, he was gaining more perspective. Mm -hmm. and I, I started to understand that. Like, you, you got more yeah. Perspective. So I would say, you know, it's good news. Yes, ma'am. I think we also learn, <coughs> I've learned anyway, that um, there's joy in the journey. When we're young, we're just always out there. When I get to this point, I'm going to be happy. When I get to this point, I'm going to be happy. And now it's just like, I'm just happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yes, yes. Learn to appreciate your mindfulness. Really? <laughs> Give me an example. You can see I was an annoying student. Give me an example, other than I'm always pouring things on myself. So. Yeah.
Yeah. Appreciation, Thanksgiving, getting in touch with it. Yeah, Trish. We totally do. <laughs> a nine minute mile, now 11 and a half looks so good, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's about being clear. Yes? Oh, be generous, express your thanksgiving. Talk about what you're happy about. Talk about what, I mean, talk about it. Thank people. Like that, that Oaksner example. People say hello, people smile, people walk towards each other. I mean, that's how you're contagiously happy. Light up your eyes. People are looking at your eyes all the time. Super example. That's a super example. That's wonderful. So that's it. You, that's, there's how you could, there I am, <laughs> here in San Diego. Uh, and, and it really was a pleasure to talk with you about happiness. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and go to the beach. I'm going to hang around for a while. If you want a, uh, a restaurant recommendation, what's tonight? Today's Monday. Yeah. Uh, theaters are dark.